Welcome, everyone. Um, good afternoon and morning, depending on where we are reaching you. Um, my name is Kirsten Stobanaw, and I um, am also a member of, of the STRIVE uh, Research Partner Consortium, which is a five-year um, research consortium funded by DFID that looks at the structural drivers of HIV-AIDS. Our, our aims are to better understand and to highlight the role of structural drivers in the HIV-AIDS epidemic. Um, and I am, uh, we work across a number of different themes. I am, along with Joyce Wamui at the National Institute of Medical Research in Mwanza, Tanzania, a co-leader of one of our thematic working group areas within STRIVE, which is on transactional sex and HIV. We are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Rebecca Fielding Miller. Dr. Fielding Miller describes herself as a public health social scientist who specializes in the social and structural determinants of HIV and gender-based violence. Her research combines um, both ethnographic and more quantitative uh, methods and highlights priorities and experiences of marginalized groups across a number of different settings, um, including Sub-Saharan Africa and specifically Swaziland, which is what she'll be talking about, her work in Swaziland today. She'll be speaking about work that came out of her dissertation research on transactional sex in Swaziland. Her research makes an important and unique contribution to uh, scholarship on the measurement of transactional sex, and furthermore, on understanding the conditions and circumstances in which transactional sex might impart risk um, of HIV. And her body of research is very much in line with the mission of the, the working group on transactional sex and HIV and, and uh, is, we feel, important for better understanding and addressing gender disparities in HIV risk in the sub-Saharan African context. Dr. Fielding Miller recently completed her Ph.D. at Emory University in the Department of Behavioral Sciences and Health Education. And before this, she completed her um, Master's of Public Health uh, at the Johns Hopkins um, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and she currently holds a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in the Division of Global Health at the University of California, San Diego. So we'd like to welcome her. Thank you so much, Kirsten. Um, so first I want to say thank you so much to all of you for joining me today, and good morning. It's um, 5 a.m. here in San Diego. <laughs> but also let me say good afternoon and good evening for those of you listening from other parts of the world. So today I want to talk about transactional sex and what we mean when we use that phrase and how we can best measure it. And like Kirsten said, this is something that the Strive Group has spent a lot of time considering, and my hope is that I can contribute to that conversation by sharing a new tool and showing some of the really interesting results that we've gotten using it. So first, what do I mean uh, when I say transactional sex, and what do we mean when we talk about risk? I think that we mean this combination of financial and social gender inequality that manifests in two ways. And also let me say, and I think we all know this, that I'm talking about something that's distinct from sex work. Sex work comes with a very particular stigmatized identity and set of occupational risks, and that's not really what we're talking about right now. Um, but for transactional sex, we know that, first of all, socially and culturally, in a lot of the world, uh, women and young women in particular, um, have less overt power than men because of gendered power hierarchies. And second, we know that in many of the contexts where we work, women, and again young women in particular, are more likely to be living in poverty and to be financially dependent on men. So what do we mean when we say transactional sex? I think that we mean this combination of ways that gender inequality and financial inequality affect women across all these different levels of the social ecology that you see here on your screen. But in particular, we mean that transactional sex is one of the ways that these things interact at the relationship level to put women at particular risk. So how do we measure that dynamic? Um, most often in quantitative studies, we use a definition very close to the one you see here on the screen. Um, the exchange of sex or money gifts or material goods. There's some variation on that. And this definition works pretty well. We know that particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, women in relationships or one-time encounters that meet this definition are at about a 50% higher risk of HIV and are more likely to experience intimate partner, intimate partner violence. But the thing is, this definition, to borrow some language from epidemiology, it's really sensitive but not very specific. When you think about it, the exchange of sex for money or gifts or material goods can encompass relationships ranging from sex work to engagement rings. And if you don't believe me, engagement rings have this long and particular fascinating history in the U.S. and Europe that I can get into, but won't. But I do think that we can agree that um, neither sex work nor engagement rings are what we mean when we say transactional sex. 
And part of the reason that defining this, what we mean is tricky, is that often when we do this type of really important, really useful quantitative research, the type that tells us that transactional sex puts women at higher risk of HIV and violence, we're using what we call an etic definition. That is a definition that helps us universally categorize relationships that happen in Madagascar or Malawi or Ghana or Lesotho or South Africa or Swaziland in a way that's comparable, in a way that's consistent with pre-existing research. And often that pre-existing research originates from Geneva or New York or Atlanta or London or San Diego, and we want to be consistent or comparable with ourselves. But on the other hand, there's been a lot of great qualitative research, again, largely in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also all over the world, and some really great examples done by members of this drive group. Um, that does a really nice job explaining the complexities and nuances and context of these relationships. And this is in large part because qualitative work is often predicated on the notion of looking for the emic perspective. That is, it doesn't start with a pre-existing definition of what transactional sex is. The researcher simply attempts to understand what this combination of financial and sexual obligation looks like from the perspective of men and women who engage in it within their own particular context. And what qualitative work often finds, using this emic frame, is that in addition to driving increased risk of IPV and HIV, as the quantitative and usually slightly more etic work shows us, is that there's also a lot of social pressures and consequences surrounding transactional sex. EMIC qualitative work shows us that women have to walk a balance between financial support that they owe or want to bring to their family and the way that a wealthy partner can help them supply that and the social censure that they often face if they're seen as pursuing this support from a partner only for financial gain. And this balancing act exists within a culture uh, that sees male financial support as normative and, in fact, pressures men to provide financial support for their wives, girlfriends, and families. And that's not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, of course. The male breadwinner is expected and normal across the globe, from San Diego to Mistero. So quantitative etic approaches are important to get us our data on prevalence and associations, but emic qualitative approaches are also really important because meaning and context are slippery. So how do we measure both at once? Well, <laughs> this is an approach that I'm really excited about. It's called cultural consensus modeling, and it's been floating around in the world of anthropology for quite a while. The idea is really simple. It's a tool that allows you to start with an edit, universal idea. In this case, the idea of transactional sex is the exchange of sex for gifts, money, or material goods, but not sex worker engagement rings. Rapidly get an emic description of that idea, and then come out the other end with a quantitative scale. And with that, you can do a few neat tricks that I'll show you in a second. So the way it works is this. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen here, I'm sure many of you remember bullseyes, much like these from your Intro to Epi courses. Over here on the left, we have something that is reliable but not valid. It hits the same mark, but it doesn't hit the bullseye. Next to that, uh, somebody's aim appears to be valid. It centers around the bullseye, but it's not very reliable, uh, followed by some work that's neither reliable nor valid. And finally, here on the right, we see that somebody has managed to hit the bullseye consistently, and they're both valid and reliable. And in this classic diagram, we know the correct answer, right? We can see the bullseye, and we know what we're aiming for. But what if we're in a situation where there's no approved correct answer, or where we want to go in and find what the local correct answer is? So in that case, we can use the emic assumption that if a group of people are answering the question reliably, they're probably doing that because it's the culturally correct answer. The classic example is tennis, for some reason. Um, if I don't know the rules to tennis, but I go out and ask a bunch of professional tennis players, I can probably safely assume that if they are consistently telling me the same thing, then that thing is correct. And we can build on that assumption. For example, if I want to know the rules to tennis, but I don't know who is and who is not a professional tennis player, I might go out and just ask 50 people in general about how to play. And I might find that 30 of those people have no idea and give me all sorts of random guesses, but 20 answer in a totally consistent way. So I would assume that those 20 people are answering consistently because they're all drawing on the same set of knowledge. And that even though they're in the minority, they're probably right because their answers cluster. And I know that these are probably the experts I want to talk to if I want to learn more about tennis. And the second interesting thing you can do is, let's say I don't want to know about tennis. I want to know about football. And maybe I go out and ask 100 people, 50 of them in the U.S. and 50 of them in, like, the entire rest of the world, to tell me the rules to football. Some of you may already see where I'm going with this. I'm probably going to get two very different sets of consistent answers. And as an American, let me tell you, both of those sets are correct. And now I know that there's two correct ways to describe the rules of football, and I have two sets of, 
sets of experts who I can ask about the two kinds of football. I hope that makes sense. If not, I'm happy to answer more questions about it later. So I wanted to use this method in Swaziland to identify different models, different culturally correct ways of going about transactional sex, to find some experts in different models and to then measure them and to give different types or models of transactional sex were associated with different levels of risk. And Swaziland, as I'm sure a lot of you know, has the highest HIV prevalence in the world. Here on the screen, uh, you can see the prevalence curve broken down by age and gender. Um, and Swaziland's epidemic, as far as anyone can tell, is really primarily driven by these structural factors that we're all working on by gender inequality, pover poverty, high unemployment, economic inequality, and food insecurity in particular. And now they're in the midst of a really terrible drought that's only making things worse. Um, but I do want to say it's also a really beautiful kingdom um, full of really brilliant and resilient people working hard on this problem. Um, this picture is a, a photograph from, from my front porch when I lived there. Um, and they're making really impressive headway against the epidemic. Um, in fact, as a brief aside, if any of you are interested in what we can learn from Swaziland's response to their epidemic, we'll be hosting a conference focusing on just that in Swaziland in the days leading up to the Durban AIDS conference, and I'll send out a tweet about it later um, for those of you who are interested. So how do we go about measuring transactional sex in Swaziland using cultural consensus modeling? The process looks something like this. You begin with a simple, rapid, convenient sample. We wandered around in some rural, urban, and peri-urban spaces with a clipboard, and asked uh, about 47 women three different questions. What do Swazi women hope to get in exchange for sex? What makes a Swazi woman agree to have sex? And what makes a Swazi woman admired? The key is, and you can see this in the little green box, we're very clear that we're asking about other women, Swazi women in general, not individual preferences. That's to give us a sense of what's known about the culture in general. And then next, and you see this in this orange box in the center, we took all those items um, that women had listed off for us, um, con which was about 175, condensed it into the 25 or 30 most common things, and went out and did it again. We took our clipboards to more public spaces, and we asked another convenient sample of women to rate those items from one to five. How important is it to Swazi women in general to get love or a cell phone or a drink or marriage um, or sexual satisfaction in exchange for sex? And I'm going to show you those lists in a minute. Um, and along with that rating data from each participant, we also collected some basic demographics so that, we went to look, so that when we went to look for clusters, um, when we did some analyses to tell us if there were different sets of women who valued items differently, we'd be able to describe those groups demographically. And also, um, we asked women for their contact details so that we could go back, find the experts who were answering right at the bullseye, and then have those experts tell us about those particular models. Um, and so then we went finally over here on the far right and did a clinic-based survey and asked, among other questions, which of these items that we learned about in the free listing and rating have you personally received from your partner? So just to be really clear, the free listing and the rating were about women's knowledge of the culture in general, what are cultural rules and preferences around transactional sex that affect everyone, and the in-depth interviews and clinic surveys were about personal behavior, what do you get from your partner? What is your personal experience uh, within your relationship? And these pictures here on the left, um, this is me and Mpumi uh, with our clipboards um, collecting rating data. Um, right here is what our um, ANC survey looks like. That's one of the volunteers, um, not a participant. So here's what we found. Um, I don't really want to get into the statistics. We can talk about it later if you want. Basically, you're doing an exploratory factor analysis with participants rather than items as the variable, so you're looking for clusters. And to be comfortable saying that you found a distinct set of knowledge, that this way of talking about football is distinct from that way of talking about football, you want this eigenvalue ratio to be greater than three, and you see that highlighted in yellow here. So as you can see, of the 77 women we talked to, four different ways of answering, of valuing what a man gives you in exchange for sex emerged, and three of them met that criteria, had that value greater than uh, three. And we found that the first group, which we later labeled aspirational based on qualitative data, was a little more likely to have been recruited somewhere urban, um, had generally completed or come close to completing secondary school, and was unlikely to be married. And I'm going to show you guys how they each of these groups rated items do in a second. Um, the next group you see circled, which we call in Kosakati, which is a Saswati word, uh, was more likely to be rural, way more likely to be married, and slightly older. And I say that now, um, I no longer consider 31 to be slightly older, but, you know. 
And the last group here on the right was younger, more educated, and much more likely to have been recruited from a university campus. Um, the fourth group here is the one that isn't circled in the second column, labeled work migration, even though it's uh, bigger, didn't meet our criteria. And they were primarily recruited from peri-urban sites, which see a lot of like work migration for factory jobs. And if I had to guess, I'd probably say that that explains why they were the biggest group, but the least cohesive. It's a lot of women coming from a lot of different backgrounds, making them less likely to be pulling on the same set of cultural knowledge. So here are, um, uh, these are not all 30 items, but here you can see how some of the different groups rated some of the different items. Um, and you can see that there's some, some de uh, decent variation here. And on the right, um, you can see this is all basically the results of a test. Um, so on the left is your answer key, and on the right is how participants scored, these are rating participants, how they scored on that test, so how, um, how many correct answers they got, basically. Um, and so what this tells us is who might be a good person to do a qualitative interview with. Because we know that participant one uh, got about 86% of the answers correct, or more accurately, she has an 86% chance of getting an answer correct when asked about the Inkosakati model of transactional sex. So she gave answers that were very close to what you see here on the far left in the answer key with basic food at 3.9 and so on. And so we know she's probably the person we want to go do a qualitative interview with. On the other hand, if participant 31 got a negative confidence score, we probably don't want her to be our expert on aspirational models of transactional sex. So that's what we did. We interviewed women who were highly competent within each model of transactional sex, and this conceptual model here in front of you is what we learned. Now, I'm not going to go on about this very long, although I have to tell you I love this model and the paper we wrote on it, which is slowly winding its way through review and which I could go on about for days. But here's the important takeaway. When we talk to women who are experts in these different ways of engaging in transactional sex, so to speak, in these different cultural models of transactional sex, we found that they were largely differentiated by two factors, by when in her life course a woman is most likely to participate in this type of relationship, which is this x-axis here, and by how socially acceptable they are, which is the y-axis. And, and the labels on this y-axis emphasized in pariah, they're drawn from gender theory, from some of Mimi Shipper's work, drawing on some of Connell's work on hegemonic masculinity. But briefly, if a relationship exists above the x-axis, it means that a woman's behavior isn't really threatening to the gender hierarchy, and it's socially acceptable or approved. And if it exists below that line, it means that she's doing something that may threaten male dominance, um, and the relationship is almost certainly considered socially unacceptable. So this uh, Inkosakati model on the far right um, both tends to happen later in life, if you remember the demographic slide from a moment ago, but it's also really, really culturally respected. And you can see in the quote up top, women feel social pressure to get married for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that they're seen as more socially stable and less of a threat to other women's husbands, which is something that's been shown in qualitative work in Malawi as well. And as far as how the transactional element, or really the element of sexual and economic entanglement plays out, you can see a quote here from an informant explaining how she conceptualizes her relationship down below. This is a married, settled woman. Her husband provides for her, and community members go to her for financial support, but also advice. Her family's happy. She's with somebody who's financially stable, and evidence of that financial stability was part of the courtship process. And so we use the term in Kosakati here in particular to describe it because that's a Swazi term that gets the idea of an older, respected married woman. Although not all of these women were married, their relationship just kind of was closest to that model. So next to that, this sort of long oval here, um, the aspirational model. And this is a woman who's also a bit older, maybe in her early, mid-20s, who would like to be married, who's hoping her relationship transitions to marriage, and who in an interview does a lot of work, we found, to rhetorically position her relationship as, as close to marriage. And I love this quote that you see here in green um, because I think it does a beautiful job of explaining this huge range of things, financial and social, that she's hoping to get from this relationship. And the way that financial stability can hopefully transition her into social stability. But she's not married. It may be that her partner is married to someone else, in which case it's likely to hover below this line and be a little less socially acceptable. Um, it may be that marriage is not on the table for whatever reason. And so some degree of financial support is expected whenever he visits. Gifts are expected when they meet, and she has to do some social and rhetorical work to position that financial support 
as proof of potential marriage, or at least that the relationship is long-term and stable so it doesn't dip below this line and become socially unacceptable. So the university model that you can see here, the sort of taller one, because it happens over a briefer span, is usually happens while a young woman is at university. And these are interesting in that there's sort of two different manifestations. You can see where it dips below that line. One is much more egalitarian and, and modern-ish, I should say, and one a little more the traditional thing we think of when we think of university transactional relationships. Um, you can see a lovely uh, description at the top of the screen uh, where financial support is definitely expected in the more egalitarian relationship, but it's seen as a part of a loving relationship in which she does owe him some respect as her boyfriend. And families, by the way, similar to in the Kosakati model, are really in favor of their daughter being with somebody who has a strong financial future, which is not illogical. And below that, you can see a quote from a woman who is in a much more sort of sugar daddy style relationship. Um, this is more traditionally what we think of when we think of transactional sex. This woman was, was affectionate towards her partner, um, but you can see here that she views the sex as obligatory, and she probably wouldn't be in this relationship if she had any alternatives. And finally, here on the bottom left, we have a sugar daddy model. Um, we didn't identify this, this through consensus modeling. You might see, um, you might remember from that initial slide, there was no sugar daddy consensus model. But we did find that during qualitative interviews, a lot of women um, reflected back on having this type of relationship when they were younger. And they used the term sugar daddy, which is why we adopted it. We have less demographic data on this, um, but the striking thing about the way a lot of about the way that a lot of women reflected back was how they were totally aware of this as sort of a bargain they were striking. Um, and that could be for a lot of reasons. Maybe women didn't want to reflect back on a more traumatic relationship, but that's what we heard in these interviews. And you can see that in this quote. Um, she freely took advantage of him, perhaps while he was also taking advantage of her. And this exists totally below this line. And what was really um, striking about the social unacceptability of these relationships, it was, it was usually women policing other women within these. So if somebody found out that she was with another woman's husband, it would be a female neighbor who called her mother, or the wife would call her. The man was sort of totally left out of this policing of um, whether or not these relationships were okay. But they were definitely policed, and they were definitely not okay. But what about HIV risk, since that's the reason that we're interested in transactional sex in the first place, right? Um, here, I think one of the most important things to note is that women, all the women we talked to, were really, really clear about the potential risks of HIV in their relationships, like they knew. Um, but they were also really aware of the social risks involved in not being in or leaving a socially approved relationship. And those social risks could come with very real material repercussions, um, uh, especially if they left, like, marriage. And that really dictated the strategies that they used to protect themselves. So in general, women who needed to preserve their relationships, who are kind of the, the higher up on this um, y-axis they were, um, really felt they couldn't turn their partners down for sex because they couldn't end this relationship or jeopardize it. But they hoped that by being constantly sexually available, they could protect themselves by avoiding cheating. So I can't leave him, but if I'm constantly sexually available, at least he won't cheat and I'll be safe. In contrast, women in less socially acceptable relationships had this different dynamic where if they if they wouldn't really face any social consequences for leaving him. They felt a lot more comfortable demanding uh, monogamy from him, negotiating condom use from him, um, or leaving if they felt that the relationship wasn't safe. Of course, if they were um, financially dependent on him, um, that was completely not the case. Negotiating condom use becomes more difficult. Um, demanding any sort of monogamy becomes more difficult. And usually she was less likely to be monogamous as well because there were less expectations of that. Okay, so the thing that I think is particularly cool um, about this study and this method is that it, because it was this really systematic mixed method design, we could move straight from that conceptual model and hypotheses that we generated from the qualitative work straight into an observational study, a quantitative study, to learn if these qualitative findings could transfer to perhaps slightly more generalizable quantitative findings. So that's what we did. We went to two different antenatal clinics, one urban, one rural, um, with three laptops, um, which you can see my Ari Cynthia here uh, demonstrating down here. And we asked about 400 women to participate in an audio computer assisted self interview survey, which was the first in Swaziland, by the way, and went uh, really well. It was, it was a fun technique. Um, 
And so in Swaziland, every woman gets an HIV test at every antenatal visit, which was a major reason why we were recruiting there, um, because dissertations don't tend to come with an enormous amount of funding. Um, So participants consented to share their test results with us. um, And when they took the survey, which also included questions about demographics, sexual history, experiences of intimate partner violence. And you can see some of those um, univariate results here on the right about our sample. And we also asked them about these things that women had named in the listing and rating phases, reasons why they had had sex with their most recent partner, um, so subjective reasons why, and also things they had gotten from their most most recent partner, both in the last year. Um, And then what we could do was weight these items that she'd received from her partner, again, according to these scales, which you see here on the left. So we could build weighted scales of transactional sex, not just a yes-no, but a how much, and the how much within three different categories, which I think is cool. And then we could measure the degree to, uh, we could measure how much, the degree to which women participated in each of these three different models, uh, how that was associated with risk of HIV and intimate partner violence, since we had that as an endpoint. So first we wanted to check our scale and see how it lined up with uh, condom use, how the degree of participation within a transactional sex model was associated with condom use. So you see here um, a fairly simple adjusted um, logistic regression. Um, Each woman was considered on the far right to have engaged in etic transactional sex if she agreed, um, if she said that she'd had sex with her most recent partner, uh, specifically because of poverty, hunger, money, or for the sake of her children. Um, So if she lined up with that sort of traditional subjective, I did this because definition. Um, But for the model scales, we assigned, uh, but for the model um, scores here, we assigned a continuous scale based on what she said she received from her partner, not her reasons. Um, And each woman was assigned three scores, and we standardized those by z-score to make them comparable. Um, I hope that makes sense. It's, I can explain more if people have questions. So the point is, um, not surprisingly, you can see here that the more consonant, so the more things of more value that a woman was with any model, so no matter how things were valued within a model, the less likely she was to use condom, which is really consistent with literature. For every standard deviation increase in the value of things she was receiving from her partner, uh, women were about 25% less likely to have used a condom the last time uh, they had sex. Now, what's interesting here on the right, you can see that the edit definition doesn't really pick this up. Um, it's just uh, it, it crosses one completely. Um, but the really interesting results, I think, start coming when you look at how the value of what a woman was getting from her partner um, corresponds to her social status. On the bottom right, you can see the MacArthur social status ladder, which has been used all around the world. Um, And for this, we asked women to place themselves on this ladder based on what they thought their social status was in their community. One at the bottom for very low, ten at the top for very high. And we found the most fascinating thing, which I haven't really seen in quantitative papers, um, but has been reported quite a bit in qualitative work, that the more things of higher value a woman received from her partner, the higher her social status, with the effect most pronounced in the university and aspirational model and only really marginally present in the Inclusicati model. But the edit definition didn't pick that up at all. And so I think there's two things going on here. There's two possibilities here. Either women of high status get better things from their partner, or getting things from their partner increases women's social status. Um, Obviously, with a cross-sectional sample, we can't say, but I think there's actually quite a bit of qualitative data out there that suggests the latter, that getting more things increases social status. Um, So in the qualitative data, we also saw that there were a lot of factors at play dictating how a woman would try and protect herself within a relationship, and that these strategies really vary depending on if she wanted or needed to stay, and if her reasons for wanting or needing to stay were primarily financial or social. So we wanted to take a closer look at this interplay between transactional sex and agency. So these are all the reasons that we asked women about why they had agreed to have sex with their most recent partner. And these are, again, drawn from the free list. And they could choose all that apply. They're subjective, remember, whereas we were measuring transactional sex as what she had objectively received. And you can see the ones that we used to conceptualize edit transactional sex are in here, poverty, money, hunger, the sake of our children. But these ones in yellow also seem to cluster together when we did some analyses. And so we designated these issues around agency, whether or not she was stuck in this relationship. And we did that using structural equation modeling um, to look at how transactional sex and agency both influence intimate partner violence uh, and HIV. So, the, okay, this slide is a bit busy. Um, so first, let me direct your attention to the bit where it says um, latent variable constrained agency. 
Um, if structural equation models are not your thing, which is, you know, totally understandable, all I need you to see from this is that all these agency-related reasons, constrained agency-related reasons, load pretty high and seem um, across the board and seem to be describing one latent construct. They hang together really well. And these are three different models that we built. So we did this three times. They're in Kosakati Aspirational University. And hunger actually loads particularly well under constrained agency at about 0.93, which makes sense because we are working in a context of very high food insecurity. Um, so when you look below that, you can see that for all the, all three models, the biggest thing um, that influenced whether or not a woman's agency was constrained as measured by these indicators is her level of education. You can see across the board it's about negative 0.2. Um, and I think that's really notable and one more piece of evidence and a testament to a lot of the hard work being done by Strive and other folks around the world about the importance of keeping girls in school and of women's education. And then when you come down here into the last few rows, you can see how constrained agency and intimate partner violence begin to play out differently across different models of transactional effects. So for all women, constrained agency was significantly associated with intimate partner violence, right, which makes sense. Um, for each unit increase in constrained agency, across the board, IPV went up by about 0.18 or 0.19 units. But then, and this is what I think is kind of remarkable, um, once you account for constrained agency, transactional sex begins to have a very different relationship with IPV. So for married women, women in Nkosukati model relationships, uh, which is not the same as married, but women kind of in that model relationship, there's no significant relationship between transactional sex and IPV once you account for agency. You can see that p-value is uh, 0.09. But for women in university and aspirational relationships, once you account for, once you include constrained agency in the model, IPV actually decreases the more things of greater value a woman receives from her partner, which is kind of wild, right? Like that is not <laughs> what we've seen in the literature. And so what I think is happening here is just what women were telling us in the qualitative data. He gives me things because he loves me, and I have sex with him because I love him, which makes sense. So once you account for the ability or inability to exit, what these women were telling us is true, or appears to be. Gifts and financial support, at least in part, may be a pretty good indicator of a loving or at least less violent relationship. And, of course, that's really complicated, and I look forward to talking about it with all of you, but I think this negative association is new and valid and, and worth some chewing. So how does this idea of constrained agency play out when it comes to HIV risk? So here we divided women into two groups. This is a multi-group structural equation model regression, which, again, don't worry about too much. Just look at the picture. It works fine. Um, and we, we divided this based on women who reported at least one indicator of constrained agency and women who didn't. And you can see about how that plays out here on the right. About 107 women reported at least one indicator of constrained agency. And this model looks at those whose agency um, was constrained. And we find that, just as before, receiving things from a sexual partner, transactional sex, increases social status, this green line from transactional sex to subjective social status, as does higher education. Although it decreases if women report being called a nasty name having to do with her sexuality. And these were local equivalents of like slut or gold digger. And we also find that once you sort of control for agency, once we do this multi-group thing, looking at women whose agency were constrained and who weren't, um, there is no link between transactional sex and condom use for this group. But we do see a positive association between condom use and HIV status, which is almost certainly an artifact of cross-sectional survey in which the large majority of women already knew their status. And we see that women who are living with HIV, um, yeah, so most women already knew their status, which is probably why condom use is highly associated with HIV. But what we do see here in this constrained agency group is that living with HIV, women living with HIV are much more likely to report a lower um, subjective social status. But what's interesting is when we look at women who don't have, who don't report an indicator of constrained agency, we see a totally different pathway from transactional sex to HIV. Um, there's really similar associations between transactional sex and social status and condom use in HIV for probably the same reasons. But we also see that receiving more things from a partner does make condom use less likely. And combined with our qualitative results and the, and the suggestion that there's less IPV in these relationships, what I think this suggests is that women really do feel that these gifts and support are a mark of love and trust, not manipulation. 
And we know we're all less likely to use condoms in relationships that we consider to be affectionate and potentially long-term. But then there's this other significant pathway or lack thereof. Unlike the constrained agency group, there's no significant association between HIV and social status for women who don't have constrained agency relationships. And what's probably happening here, um, because women in constrained and unconstrained relationships have about the same rate of HIV prevalence, is we're seeing that some women appear to suffer more from HIV stigma than others. And those are women who already have constrained agency, who may have fewer places to turn when they need help with food or rent or any other financial necessities. Which means that when we think about transactional sex, and here, as you may have guessed, is what I keep coming to, we can't only focus on material resources. We have to think about the social risks and benefits and motivations, too. And when we design our intervention, we have to think very carefully about who we're targeting and what she might already be experiencing. Are we further pathologizing or marginalizing women who are already marginalized? Are we, by saying you are in a sugar daddy relationship, you are in a hidden sort of socially unacceptable relationship, are we reinforcing this idea that this is socially unacceptable and deserving of some scorn and marginalization? And are we pushing women who are already experiencing higher risk into deeper risk? So, <laughs> which I think, which was one of my major takeaways from this. Okay, so given all that, what do we mean when we say transactional sex? First, I think we mean a spectrum, not a binary. No relationship is all one thing or another. Um, and we mean in, uh, different things in different places, and sometimes we can mean three different things in one place, right? But we also mean that this is a spectrum and different things that we can and should measure based on concrete behaviors. Um, and the thing I like about this message is it's really fast. It probably took me longer to explain it than to do it. It's cheap, let me tell you. Um, and it gives us a wealth of knowledge beyond this traditional yes-no measure. Second, <clears throat> I think we mean a relationship that has physical risk, but also, as I keep coming to, social risks. Women um, might feel pressure to stay in a marriage because to leave is to abandon her social place in the community or to stay with a partner because her family thinks she has a strong financial future. And so they're not just making an economic bargain. They're making um, a social bargain that has strong economic consequences. When you think about how respected marriages, long-term relationships are, um, and what and, and the marginalization and lack of resources that come with um, uh, being constrained, being less respected. And, and also, we know that the physical risks depend a lot on social pressures. Can she leave? If not, what else can she do? Um, women know about the physical and social risks and benefits, and they're constantly balancing them. Third and finally, I think when we say transactional sex, we mean relationships I think, from a programming point of view, with constrained agency, not necessarily any relationship with um, such a, with a certain degree of sexual and economic obligation. Can she leave? Does she want to? And it's the constrained agency that we want our programming to address within a, within the wider social context that matters, uh, which, of course, is a great argument for cash transfers and education and other interventions that focus on uh, women's agency and empowerment rather than whether or not their boyfriend is um, – or uh, any other partner is giving them gifts or financial support. So thank you so much. Um, and of course, a huge amount of thanks to the 559 Swazi women who spoke with us as part of this study, um, as well as my research assistants, who you can see many of them here on the right, uh, Sam and Pumi, Nochancha and Cynthia, um, as well as everybody here who provided funding, CIFAR from Emory, Fulbright, um, Mircha, Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm really looking forward to your questions, and you can see my contact information and website here on the right if you want to get in touch after this presentation. Thank you. I see a question about textile workers, um, as we feel they engage more in transactional sex. Um, so we that was the Perry Urban, that was the work migration group that we spoke with. Um, because we do know that in, in Swaziland there's a lot of textile and um, canning work, and we know that there's a lot of transactional sex and sex work that happens around those factories. Um, and so we did actually specifically go out recruiting um, very near those factories because we thought that that would perhaps be a particular form of transactional sex. Um, but that was, again, the work migration group, and I think what happened there is 
um, that sort of failed to cohere, possibly because there were so many women coming from so many different backgrounds um, uh, that they were all sort of having different priorities. And it might be that that veers a little closer to uh, traditional sex work in Swaziland in particular. So we also have a question here from Nambusi Kigome, who's also a uh, part of the, the Strive uh, Working Group on Transactional Sex. She says, thank you, Rebecca. That was fascinating. Can you play, please say a little bit about how you defined or measured constrained agency? Yeah. Um, so let me go back a little bit and show you this right here. So what we did is um, in addition to, these were our three, three listing questions. We asked what Swazi women get or hope to get, um, but we also asked um, what makes the Swazi women agree to have sex. And we went through the same whole same process. We got about 100 and something free list answers. We condensed that to about 30 and then we did rating, um, which we didn't really use in this study. But so what we found is um, just doing a little bit of um, uh, we, uh, we did a little bit of exploratory factor analysis to see if any of these reasons, um, all of these sort of pink and white things, if any of them clustered in just a basic exploratory factor analysis. Um, and we found that these reasons in yellow tended to load together, that these seemed to um, um, go together in women's answers. Um, and so we I used those differently in, in the IPV study and in the HIV study. So in the IPV study, um, we just use those as, as a latent variable. We said those are a latent construct. Um, those go together and um, sort of uh, basically confirmatory factor analysis. They all seem to be measuring one thing, and then we just did a, a regression onto that latent variable. Um, but in the constrained agency and HIV um, analysis, we did what's called a multi-group um, structural equation model, um, which sort of partitioned out and somebody who does a lot of this is going to um, wrap me for using the wrong uh, uh, language, statistical language here. But it sort of it, it runs both groups simultaneously, but um, sort of partitions out what's happening with women who reported at least one indicator of constrained agency and women who didn't. And we did one or more because um, most women only reported one or two. Great. So there's a, a number of additional questions that have come in, um, which is exciting. Um, so one question, and I think um, this is an important one, is uh, I'm really interested in your thoughts of how the insights from this study could be incorporated into broader surveys. Is there a way to standardize this into a set of survey questions? I'm wondering mm -hmm. about you know the, the the feasibility of being able to 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 do that. Yeah, that's something I've thought a lot about because it's a really good question and. I sort of go back and forth because the entire philosophy of this method is that we can rapidly um, assess and measure local uh, priorities. Um, so I think it might be worth seeing if um, we could do a whole one of these for, um, I don't know, for Southern Africa, the Swaziland, Lesotho, and, and South Africa tend to hang together. Um, my more sort of purest inclination is to say that maybe the standardized thing should be three weeks of formative work where we go out and find um, the top five most important things in whatever context we're working in. Um, I, I think that would be ideal. I think it's less practical. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, in the long run, I don't know. I, I think this is really an argument for, for, for formative work, which is maybe less practical for big things like the DHS. But again, let me emphasize, this was the part where we built these scales was two weeks and some clipboards. I think this is really, really viable for um, any any sort of local-ish study. Next question was, if constrained agency should be addressed but not necessarily transactional sex, this is from Carolyn, Caroline Tangeren, um, how does one make sure that cash transfers and other similar interventions do not pathologize women in sugar daddy type relationships? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And again, something that I've considered a lot. Um, I think that they, I think that it's a matter of, um, in a lot of cases, how we are targeting and how we are framing our interventions. Um, so, for example, the um, the cash um, trials or, or conditional cash transfers that are predicated on women staying in school, um, I I don't see how that would um, perpetuate any type of of sort of pathology or marginalization because. 
um, we, we want all girls to stay in school. There's nothing wrong with that. I think um, this is more a note to sort of uh, more local or on-the-ground programming, and, and we might have all seen these of, you know, um, avoid sugar daddy relationships, or I think it's a note to be careful about our, our language and our messaging um, in who we um, – who we say is doing the wrong thing or or sort of what values might be implicitly embedded in, in our messaging. So um, when we kind of position transactional sex as something close to sex work, as we all know, is, which as we all know is really stigmatizing, and kind of decide like, oh, well, she is being totally financially supported by him, um, but it's okay because they will probably get married someday, so that's fine. Um, thanks. So we have, um, I think Darren Adams has unmuted himself and, and, and would like to, to ask a question. Darren, are you there? Hi, Becca. It's um, definitely a pleasure to hear you present on this. Um, and Becca and I work together in Swaziland on a innocent and sex work study. Um, and it's really great to see you progress in your work. And this is fascinating and amazing. Um, so I was recently in Swaziland in um November and doing some key populations assessments and the drought there is really bad as as well as yeah, in Southern Africa, yeah. um, particularly really bad in Lava Mesa, yeah. and um, it's it, you know yeah, uh, and it's my prediction that sex work will, um, will increase mm-hmm. as well as mm-hmm. transactional sex. Mm-hmm. So um, a part of this is that you know. PEPFAR and other donors are, you know, planning for the coming year. And if you were going to give them strategic advice <laughs> on <laughs> how to incorporate your research into um, thinking about their programs more broadly, um, what would you tell them? Yeah, thanks, Darren. Um, oh, and you're, you're so right. I, I've been watching this drought kind of from afar, and it's it's really bad. And I think you guys saw that um, – uh, hunger was definitely one of these reasons that constrained agency, and, and it's only going to become more important, um, especially as, you know, climate change um, makes events like this more common. Um, if I was to give uh, Pepfar some thoughts about this, um, I think we need to be, first of all, really thoughtful about what our programming looks like on the ground. So I did some work around food security specifically as part of this study, and one of the really striking things was um, even among pregnant women, there's just not a lot of – there's kind of a food prescription program that um, doesn't meet uh, – doesn't doesn't reach out to even um, that many women who are living uh, with HIV and pregnant. Um, and I think – a lot of the driving force of sex work in particular and will be growing in transactional sex is, is just hunger. You, you do what you have to when you're hungry, right? And I think that's when we really start talking about totally constrained agency. You do what you have to to feed your children. Um, and obviously we can't t- change the climate, and there's only so much um, political pushing that can be done. But um, really I, I do think that centering education and centering food security, um, which can be done together and is often done in, in South Africa, right, with feeding schemes, um, could go a long way. If people have enough to eat, <laughs> if people are educated and have enough to eat, that's going to go a long, long way towards um, making sure that people have the agency to uh, to make the choices and be in relationships they want to be in. Okay. Um, a question from Meghna Ranganathan who asks, um, do you have any idea of the percentage of women, um, uh, in, I think, in your study, who would have said mm-hmm. yes to engaging in, in sex work? And, and did you account for that? So the oh, potential yeah. that there's any overlap between these these categories, I think. Is pretty well. mm-hmm. Yeah, so we, uh, as you can see, we did ask about sex work, um, if that was the reason that she had had sex with her most recent partner. And it was really low. Um, it was... I think two out of 400 women. Um, I think that's an artifact of how we conducted the study, not how much sex work was going on. Um, the rural clinic where we did this study um, actually has quite a bit of, it's very close to a, a prominent sex work hotspot. Um, so I think, A, sex workers were not opting to take our study, um, and B, women who did were probably not clicking, oh, yes, definitely, because it wasn't a sex work-directed um, uh, uh, study. 
Mm-hmm. Um, um, but of the women, but of women who clicked yes on this sort of um, more etic idea of transactional sex, I had sex because of poverty or money or hunger, sort of for financial reasons. That was about, I think, about 11 or 13 percent, which does line up with what we see um, in a lot of this part of the world. I think that's all of your questions. Did I forget a second half? No, I think. Wait, what was 11 to 13 percent? You just said the um, the sort of etic definition of transactional sex. So I had sex ah, because yeah. of poverty or money or hunger was okay. about 11, 13 percent. Okay. Um, great. I think the other part of Magna's question was um, was addressed already. Um, okay. So uh, Christine Clanahan has a question uh, regarding sexual exploitation. Christine, did you want to unmute yourself to ask the question? There's a, there's another group, a body of work, uh, looking at the relationship between transactional sex and sexual exploitation, and mm-hmm. um, um, and particularly sexual exploitation um, uh, with minors with children. Um, yeah. And um, do you have? I mean, you know. Do you have sort of a position on on you know where and to what extent those those two spheres um, overlap? Mm. Trend, you know, the relationship between transactional sex and sexual exploitation. <laughs> yeah. So this study, I want to say right off the bat, everybody we talked to was over eighteen, and that was mostly for ethics um, reasons. Um, I do want to say that when we were in the clinics. Um, we very rarely saw, we, we excluded very few women, almost nobody, for being under 18. Um, and I'm fairly certain that's not because women um, use condoms until they're 18 and then stop, right? Um, and that's also been, and what's been shown um, in some of Alison Ruark's work coming out of Swaziland is, for the most part, women will have maybe like one or two kind of uncomfortable encounters, sometimes with older men in their early teens, and then... Um, uh, sort of like stop until they finish school until they're 18 or 19. Um, but what we what we did see was about five percent of the sample when we asked them um, about their first sexual encounter. Um, about five percent did say that it, their first sexual encounter was with like a, a teacher or a neighbor or like a, a family member um, when they were younger. Something that would and and that those women who had these very early and what I'm comfortable categorizing as very negative for sexual encounters did have just across the board uh, worse outcomes, higher rates of HIV, higher rates of IPV. And I think we know there's a really strong literature on that. Um, mm-hmm. So our qualitative work, most of the women who reflected back on these relationships when they were younger um, weren't weren't really sharing any stories of, of sort of trauma or upset, but I think that's because our guide wasn't getting at them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would say more anecdotally based on conducting this than on our data, it's, it's definitely happening, and there's a very particular and small-ish but um, subset of women with an outsized amount of um, um, negative outcomes, including much more negative experiences with transactional sex with absolutely much less agency. Oh, hi. This is Lori. I have a question, and I apologize because I, I missed the very beginning, so I may mm-hmm. have to be interpreting this wrong, but... Is it the, is it true that your data are suggesting that the association with HIV is stronger for those with the constrained agency, i.e., the poverty, fear of violence, rape, those ones, and not so much with the other two spectrums? Is that what I heard you say? Uh, well, actually, we found that there were. Um, it was about the same prevalence um, okay. in both groups. This sort of constrained group, 107 women and unconstrained, had about the same um, prevalence of HIV. What was different was the pathway. Um, so women who had constrained agency were much more likely to report um, low subjective social status, and women who were unconstrained didn't report that at all, even though there was the same prevalence, but they were much more likely to report um, uh, not using condoms the more stuff they'd gotten from their partner. Okay, and you didn't have um, – so you have no way of, in terms of what you've collected or, the, or what you have to look at the possibility – I mean, one of the other hypotheses that has emerged from other studies is that women or girls who are engaging in 
the kind of more aspirational uh, mm-hmm. or social mobility type of, of, of transactional sex are are end up having more partners because mm-hmm. they if a relationship is no longer generating social mm-hmm. capital mm-hmm. and and all of that they switch and go on to the next one which is one of the theories of of why you would see higher potentially higher rates of HIV mm-hmm. did you have any way of commenting on on numbers of partners in your study Yes, yeah, so we did ask about um, numbers of partner uh, lifetime and last 12 months, and everything you see here is referring to um, the most recent partner in the last 12 months, although we have data on, I think, of the 400 women, about 25 reported having more than one partner in the last 12 months, which uh, they were pregnant. I mean, that may or may not be accurate. Um, so I, I'm trying to remember. I think we did look at, obviously, we looked at um, lifetime numbers of of partners and how that predicted HIV, and I think it wasn't predictive, which is why we took it out of the model. Mm. I think, and in large part, this is because our sample was pregnant women, right? So your oh, right. sexual behavior and, and partner is probably going to alter quite a bit when you're pregnant. Um, so I, I think this is probably a pretty okay. bad sample for looking at recent um, recent currency and recent switches. And in the qualitative data, um, women didn't really speak to that either, and I'm trying to think now if that was an issue with uh, with probing. It's probably more likely an issue with probing because, again, other qualitative work, again, Alison Ruark's, um does kind of show more of this partner juggling, so to speak, but ours doesn't. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you, um, Rebecca, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your really fantastic questions. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to – we didn't get a chance to cover every single one. Um, um, but I'm, I'm sure Rebecca has a slide with a way to contact her. Do you have a slide with a way do. to contact you, Rebecca? There, is, there, there it is. Um, uh, so please feel free to follow up with her uh, directly. And I, I think that's all for today. Thank you, everyone, so much, participants and presenters.